Hi everyone, this is Neil again with Portal to Ascension at the Portal to Ascension conference. We're having an awesome time, um, a lot of great energy, a lot of producers, some documentary writers, um, different event pr uh, producers in the consciousness field are here. So this is truly a collaboratory and event based on unity. And we have some of the most amazing presenters here. That is the testimony I'm getting from most of the people that the, the caliber of people here, the information that they're conveying, their energy and how dynamic their presentations are truly awe-inspiring and powerful. And I am blessed to be here right now with one of those individuals, Billy Carson from Forbidden Knowledge and author of Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, Volume 1. He's on his way with Volume 2 pretty soon. And Billy Carson is an all-around amazing person that has actually, I've been following for quite some time, but definitely over social media and Instagram, his um, his information is getting out to many people, hundreds of thousands of people following him on Instagram, where he can drop some knowledge really quick and get it out to a lot of people. So it's, it's amazing and great to have him here because of his reach and his ability to get a message of truth and wisdom out to the masses. So Billy, brother, I'm Super blessed to have you, man. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, for sure. So I want to learn. We when I picked you up from the airport, you told me a little bit about your story, about how you got into it, and like the different um, milestones that really created what you have now. So mm -hmm. why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and mm -hmm. how you got into this information in the first place? Sure. When I was a child living in Opelika, Florida, I was born in New York City, but I moved to uh, to Miami mm -hmm. when I was about seven years old, and uh, I used to go in my backyard, watch the airplanes go over from the Opelika Airport. One day, this orb went over, not an airplane, and it cleared the horizon in seconds, not minutes. Mm -hmm. So right away as a child, even though this is 1977, I believe, so even as a child, I knew that that wasn't normal. UFO wasn't in my vocabulary. Aliens weren't in my vocabulary. We only had three channels on TV right. and no cable TV, so there wasn't any outside influence. So I went to Rainbow Park Elementary the next day, literally, and pulled on all the Encyclopedia Britannicas on aerospace and started looking for what kind of technology I could have saw. Because when this thing came back over and hovered and then took off the other way, I saw it was a metallic object. It was something that was, in my personal opinion, physical, a real object. Uh, so I literally started investigating and researching all the way back in 1977. Mm. Much later on, in around 2010, I had another experience when I was working on an underground shelter project which actually ended up being featured on a History Channel show. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, during this whole process and construction and work, working out this whole situation as to where to build it and dig and everything else, I had a, uh, I guess, a close encounter of the fourth kind, some would call it, where these two mm -hmm. greys came actually to my house. Not too late in the evening, 9 o'clock at night, people were in the house. Um, and they didn't um, do any type of telepathic communication with me, but they did something which caused my brain to shake in my skull and caused me to try to scream and I couldn't get the, the sounds out. When they left, I felt a little change. It felt like a little bit of a different person. It took me down another path. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason it happened, I'm not sure, but two things burned into my mind. One was a worldwide telescope, which I ended up going and researching and looking up because it just kept coming up in my mind over and over again. Ended up being a real, a real website that existed with software wow. to, to download. Yeah. And I downloaded this software and was able to access information about uh, all the space probes and, and rovers in our solar system. And then the other thing was quantum mechanics and quantum physics, which I started diving into heavily right. and became pretty decent at. And this was in 2010? Yeah, 2010. Right. So what do you feel it was? It was like a kind of a download, maybe some messages that in gave you download or sparked some sort of awareness that you had already within you? What do you feel actually happened there? Looking, well, and it, when it happened, I was horrified. Uh, it really disrupted my whole family life, including wow. uh, mostly a catalyst to actual divorces as well. So oh, I didn't wow. win anything from this situation. I kept it quiet for some time. Uh, but looking back on it now, it seems like it may have been some type of download or force-fed information into my mind, or right. maybe a scan of my mind for whatever reason possible. But I do the, after, after it happened, those two things were there. And I have to admit, I did feel a little bit smarter after that. Right. So you said in 2010 you were working on a project that got picked up by the History Channel. Yeah. What was the project? It's called Fort Terra Nova. It's uh -huh. an underground city the size of three Walmarts that can save the lives of 360 people right. in case of a local, global, or geological disaster worldwide. How did you come across that information? I was researching the procession of the equinoxes on my own just as an amateur astronomer. Okay. And nothing, I nothing to do with consciousness or spirituality at that point? Nothing to do with conscious, consciousness or spirituality just uh, had to do with geology and astrobiology and uh, astrophysics. 
I realized that procession of the equinoxes was speeding up, and that mm -hmm. alarmed me because in order for procession to speed up, that means our sun would have to be moving faster, and if it's moving faster, that means it's going to orbit something. What is it going to orbit? Mm -hmm. So I started looking into all the potential situations that could happen, and I found out that scientists have been looking at this for a while, that we are speeding up a procession and that um, we may be orbiting another spatial body. And that's when I discovered that we are orbiting another sun. It's a brown dwarf star. Right. It's already been discovered. It's not even a mystery anymore. It orbits us every 4,500 years, or we orbit it, uh, so to speak. And we live in a binary solar system. But I, I found that the gravitational effects of this uh, on a close orbit could cause a, a, a geological disaster on this planet, and it has in the past, according to ancient texts, along certain timelines, and that um, I felt that that needed to be built to, to ensure the survival of maybe a future generation of wow. mines. Is this connected to the Anunnaki story at all? Uh, yes, actually it is. That's how I found out about the Anunnaki, to be honest. I didn't find out about them first and then work on this. Yeah. I found out about this first, and then through my research into the geology and through astrobiology and astrophysics, I discovered that the Anunnaki uh, were in the ancient Sumerian tablets and, and uh, some of these other gods spoken about in the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, mm -hmm. and some of the other ancient texts as well. Wow. That's really amazing because when I first got into this, I got into the ancient alien question, but through Sumerian scriptures, but it was, I was raised Hindu and I wanted to learn about vibration and frequency, mm -hmm. but I stumbled onto the Sumerian scriptures talking about vibration, frequency, DNA, serpentine yeah. energy, and then the next thing I figured out was the Mahabharata as well. Okay. So there's this, this huge connection going on here, but you saying 4,500 years um, rotation around the star. I'm curious to know, if you were studying the sun speed going faster, how does that happen in a binary star system? Well, what happens is when you're in a, in a binary star system, and you, that means you have two huge spatial bodies that are orbiting each other. So yeah. as they get closer, they need to obtain breakaway speed. So as, they, as they're getting closer, they, they speed up, then they break away, then they slow down just a little bit, just yeah, enough. Yeah. And then they speed up again, and, they, and so it's a, just a weird elliptical orbit that they have around each other, and along with them, they pull all the other planets. Right, right, uh, right. Scientists and, and astrologers have already, uh, astronomers have already found this other brown dwarf, and it has planets orbiting it. So there's a solar system within our solar system just outside the orbit of Pluto. Wow. And there's multiple planets in that solar system? There's planets orbiting, probably six planets orbiting this brown dwarf, this brown dwarf. Right. and this is actually peer-reviewed vetted science. It's not even like a mystery or a conspiracy. This is actually real science. It's going to be in right. future science books. Right. What about uh, Nibiru? Is the brown dwarf Nibiru, does, is, or does Nibiru rotate around that brown dwarf, and is Nibiru still in existence? Yeah, see, so that's where a lot of the confusion comes. A lot of the people who have been looking for this Nibiru think it's a single uh, rogue planet, mm. but now due to all the research I've put in, I believe that it's a planet that orbits a brown dwarf star, mm -hmm. which would account for some of the descriptions of Nibiru in some of the ancient texts, as well as the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation, and also the, uh, the uh, Epic of Atraasis, or the Atraasis Epic. Those two predate Zacharias Hitchens' work by hundreds of years, and they've been translated for hundreds of years long before Zacharias oh, wow. Hitchens was even born. So they were, they were dealing with and going deep into the Sumerian tablets, so Zacharias Hitchens was not the first one to do that. Oh, no, no. He's not the first and wasn't even close to the first. There were people doing this all the way back in the 1700s that had already gotten to the, uh, the Sumerian tablets and already had deciphered uh, those two main pieces of work I just mentioned, as right. well as the Epic of Gilgamesh as well. Right. There have been people recently that have been saying that um, Zachariah Sitchin's work is not entirely correct, that it, a lot of it is true, but it, some of the gaps were, you know, words were put in because we didn't really know what it meant, what it represented. Um, is there a kind of a different picture that is now emerging about the Anunnaki that maybe hasn't been taught in pop culture and ancient alien theory for some time? Actually, no. A lot of uh, Zacharias Hitchens' work has actually been venerated because uh, a lot of people have now gone and independently, including myself, mm -hmm. researched these tablets. Mm -hmm. And anybody can read the tablets because yeah. UCLA has a CDLI online cuneiform library. You can go there and take a stone off the virtual shelf and drop it into a translator and read the stones yourself. You don't even need anybody else. And what I found, and many others have found, is that his story was pretty close to being on. Now, everybody has their own perspective as to what you fill in the blanks, yeah. but the underlying story is the same with everybody. Right, Beings right. came here from another planet or maybe another star system. They began to strip mine this planet for resources as well as Mars. Yeah. At some point, uh, they engaged in genetic modification of an existing hominid on this planet. They didn't create human beings from scratch. They, they, they genetically modified 
the beings that were on our cousins before we became homo sapiens, whatever we were, they genetically modified, probably making us a lot more dumbed down because mm -hmm. that's where you get the junk DNA. Oh, interesting. We've been disconnected. Our brains were bigger. Our cousins' brains were much bigger than our brains right now, which means they were probably much smarter. The pineal guns were probably bigger as well. So the story of us being a primitive human and then genetically altered to be a half god, Anunnaki, half primitive, may may not be correct, and we may have been actually more sentient and more conscious, and then it actually went the other way around. Absolutely. I truly believe that we were uh, much smarter, much more intelligent, yeah. and much more advanced. Not technologically advanced, more spiritually advanced, more right. in tune with the planet, the earth, the frequency, the human resonance of the earth. Mm. Our, our billions of magnetite crystals in our brains were probably being used. We were able to probably navigate the planet, communicate silently and everything else. Uh, may, may have even had other gifts, but I think that was all disconnected when they turned us into slaves and put a gene in, which has been scientifically discovered now, a gene put into us for worship, uh, as well as uh, chromosome number two being taken out and fused together, and two telomere caps being put on each end to, to shorten our lifespans. This story shows up in antiquity in many different cultures. Yeah. At one time, I used to feel that there were independent stories that may be the same thing that as above, so below, the reflection of the stars and the procession of the equinox manifesting in the physical in the world, right? Mm -hmm. What do you feel? Do you feel that there was one original story and everything was taken from it? Or do you think that this genetic manipulation with different races has happened many times over the eons? I think that um, we are in a situation where the Anunnaki arrived here, or these Atlantean culture arrived here mm -hmm. at the time that we fell. I believe that our former human cousins were here and had risen and fallen four times, just like the Mayans said. Mm -hmm to high levels of civilization on our own. And I believe that the Anunnaki arrived on this planet at a time when we had already fallen again yeah. in terms of technology for whatever reason, uh, whether it was war, whether it was a yeah, geological yeah. disaster. Perfect infiltration. Perfect. Right. They, they arrived at a perfect time in our yeah. history, and uh, they were able to masquerade as gods and utilize that against wow. us. And what is the timeline we're looking at? 450,000 years ago, they arrived here. Uh, they then mined this planet and worked and lived on this planet along with us and with, along with other humanoids that were already here, including the Ubaid culture, which was more reptilian. They found those statuettes already in Iraq. Uh, and then around 200,000 years into it is when they began infighting and uh, some of the working class EGG Anunnaki began to want to have a coup against the rulers. Yeah. Uh, and that's when the decision was made to genetically modify an existing hominid. They could have begun with AI technology, kind of eludes to that type of wording, but they knew that uh, that could be dangerous for them as competitors because uh, they had a few of them already working in the medical labs, but I, I feel that they, they thought that maybe uh, AI, as we now have, are finding out, could be extremely dangerous if you turn Skynet on. Mm -hmm. uh, at, one, at some point, they could realize that human beings are not even needed anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so they decided to create a worker slave that they can manipulate and they can use, and that's unfortunately us. The Ajiji aren't talked about enough. We heard about the Anunnaki, those from heavens come to earth. Yeah. When I first got into the scriptures, I was listening to Jordan Maxwell, right? right? And he had the sons of God. It was all about the Ajiji. Mm -hmm. um, who are the Ajiji, and what did they represent? What did they do on this planet? The Ajiji are the working class Anunnaki. Now, they weren't slaves. But they were kind of treated as slaves. Uh, most of them was, were uh, sent to Mars to work on Mars, and they were complaining about the atmosphere. They were complaining about conditions there. Mars was already kind of a scarred planet. It was, uh, was and still even is now, a livable planet. It, was, it used to be a moon. It was a moon of uh, Tiamat before Tiamat exploded and turned into the asteroid belt. Uh, now, these Ijiji, they are the ones spoken about in the Old Testament that basically fell to earth is when they came to earth and then took women as, uh, as their wives. They had no women, they had nothing. They were just working, working, working with no women, no vacations, no breaks, and the workload was getting heavier and heavier and the conditions were getting worse and worse. Uh, and that's when they decided, you know, what we had enough. And uh, so this was a class of people, more like a working class of people that, I don't know if they volunteered to come along with the, uh, with the Pantheon uh, or if they were forced to come, but at some point, they got fed up with everything. Were they the same race as the Anunnaki or a different kind of demigod like Zeus compared to Hercules? I believe that they were a different race. Yeah. And when you start looking into these tablets, you start to realize that these Anunnaki might have been a multiracial group of beings, not just all from this Nibiru place. Multiple extraterrestrial races? Right, multiple okay. extraterrestrial races. There's even one passage that kind of alludes to one of the Anunnaki marrying somebody from another planet. 
So you start to look into this and you start going, wow, this may have been a multicultural uh, uh, race of people. Yeah. And when you look at the Adla uh, the uh, Emerald Tablets, which I wrote about, where uh, Thoth is sent here by his dad, or sent to the land of Kim by his dad, to raise them back to a high level of civilization because of the flood just happened, all of a sudden he's talking about his crew spreading out all over the planet and actually uh, duplicating what they did in the land of Kim. And then all of a sudden you start to see these megalithic structures and these pyramids all over the world. So they became a global civilization again. But what's interesting is you have people all over the world in these areas that then possibly took on the genetic marker of their new ruler or king who started that civilization, which hence could be the reason for having different races on this planet. Right. Races, in my opinion, after doing a lot of research on biology, yeah. have nothing to do with I'm dark because I, from my people are from this uh, sunny yeah, area, yeah. and that's all. The real genetics talks about a, a almost two percent variance between a Caucasian, a black man, a, a, a Native American, uh, an Indian, a Chinese person. There's a variance there. It doesn't mean that we're not all one because we're still a race, a human race. But what it does mean is on a genetic level, just through just through pure evolution virtually impossible in the short amount of time we've been here for us to have that variance. That variance was a purposeful one. It was done in a laboratory. Yeah. And it could be a mark of, okay, these are my people, these are my people, these are my people. This is the region that they're in. Uh, and they raise up these, geolo these megalithic structures all over these geological node points to these magnetic points around the planet. Mm -hmm. So the Ajiji, were they, were the Anunnaki all negative, all positive, and were the Ajiji either of that either? It was just like, they're just like us, so we're just like them. Uh, they, they were good people and bad people, good, you know, good Ajiji, good Anunnaki, bad, and so forth. Uh, some really loved us, some I actually risked losing their ability to even go back to their home world by marrying human beings, taking them as wives, um, and, and decided even some to stay here just because of that, because they fell in love with humans. Um, so, and some tried to help, like Thoth the Atlantean, he literally was wanted to help and help us raise our consciousness to a higher level. And why I respect him is because he never masqueraded as a god. He always said that he was a son of Atlantis, uh, you know, a ch or a child of the sun. And um, he never said, I'm your god and you do what I say and so forth and so on. He was deified long after he left a certain area. He left an area, he became then deified. And that's how he became called a god. But he never masqueraded as a god. Right, right. If you track uh, human history from the fallen angels, the Ijiji, mm -hmm. there have also been scriptures out there that talk about the Anunnaki staying in the heavens with the Ijiji or the slave drivers or whatever you want to ever call them, they were doing the work down mm -hmm. here. So were the Ijiji, well, did the Anunnaki leave and go home and were the Ijiji left here? And is the Ijiji the bloodline that became the elite and the cabal in the world? I believe so. After the last pyramid war, uh, where Amun Ra was the one who instigated it again, um, he escaped. But what, what happened was there was a nuclear war, most likely, and a lot of evidence of this nuclear war has been left all around the planet, where you have vitrified buildings, sand being vitrified in the Middle East. You have uh, Mohenjo-Daro in the Indus Valley. Buildings are vitrified, dead bodies still laying in the street with high levels of radiation in them until this very day, not even touched by scavenging animals. So I believe that at that time um, there was a, a war, and a lot of them left, but some of these working class Ijiji people stayed here. They already had wives and families and bloodlines and everything else probably even leading to the Merovingian bloodline, which would have led to Yeshua, who some people call Jesus. Uh, so I believe that the bloodline stayed, and when you really track these bloodlines and track it all the way back from the, um, the uh, Sumerian kings list at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England, you discover that uh, some of these Anunnaki people were ruling the earth for 28, 14, 15, 20,000 years, and they ended up being over 140,000 years, but then you track that bloodline, it leads after the Great Flood into a half human, half Anunnaki bloodline that they had, which uh, was like the kingship or the pharaonic bloodline. And then you've tracked that after Alexander the Great conquers Egypt far in the future from that point. Uh, these, these pharaohs and their, their bloodlines start, start basically migrating towards Europe. And across that time, they're mating with Arabs, they're mating with um, people from the Caucasus Mountains and so forth. They end up in England, they start another kingdom there. Uh, they become mostly Caucasian by this, by this time, but their lineage goes all the way back to that Sumerian king's list from there, you can track it all the way into the future, into the present, current day, where we're at now, with the presidents of the United States all being directly related to that same exact bloodline, all cousins, genetically proven, proven on the genealogies, many genealogy sites, and also even admitted by most of the presidents, current presidents themselves, including Obama's already admitted, uh, Bush, uh, Trump, 
Clinton. Yeah. It's uh, even Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton are actual cousins. They're yeah. like eighth cousins, uh, and so forth. Bill Clinton is a cousin of Hillary Clinton. Obama yeah, and yeah. Bush are cousins. So it just goes way back, and it just shows you that. Um, no matter who wins the presidency of the United States, they always win because they have right, right. dogs on both sides, basically. And uh, so, no matter wh which one wins, they always they always win. They meaning the, the people that really run this planet. And it makes you wonder: from birth, these people have to be conditioned to become our leaders. Yes. From before birth, yeah. from like thousands of years, the plan has to have been over thousands of years. But we live for such a short period of time that yeah. we forget, mm -hmm. right? And the new generation doesn't care about the problems of the old generation because right. we have too much now. It's been a really well constructed system to keep us enslaved, if you want to call it that, right? Mm -hmm. Were the Ijiji so? If the before the before the Great Flood was the bloodline pure, and after the Great Flood, you said it became half human, yeah. half um, Anunnaki. So it changed right after that, but it was pure before. Yeah, before the flood, it was a pure bloodline, kingship. After the Great Flood, a decision was made to hand over kingship to um, to humans, but not just humans in direct. You'd have to have a contact or a person in the middle, and that middle person would be half human and half uh, Anunnaki or half Atlantean, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so that's how they maintain that bloodline, a little bit of control there. Uh, and these people that are ruling this planet, if you ask them, they truly believe that they were designed and born and bred to to rule over everybody, on the, to own us and rule over us and tell us what to do and control us. Mm -hmm. Rothschild, Rock, Rockefeller, all these people are in their mind. That's their reality. That's what they feel. Yeah. Even the Ijiji, who are the working class that were treated almost like slaves by their overlords, yeah. came here and instead of being like, no, I don't like this, they started doing the exact same thing. Yeah. And even if some of them were good people that were just on this planet getting um, a meeting with you know, the mm -hmm. daughters of men, yeah. over time it seems they created this systematic control of mm -hmm. power. Yeah. And power obviously creates more power and once you want have some, after thousands of years it makes sense yeah. that they would be at the level of complete delusion of power that they are right now. Is that yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah, what happens is you get a God complex. And when you start ruling and controlling people in a way and telling people that you're a God over time, you truly start to believe it. Yeah. This happens in current day times right now with people that live here, you know, that are running countries. Yeah. Uh, you start to get a God complex, and they actually got a God complex. They had so much superior technology over us. They had a much better understanding of the ether of space-time itself, how to manipulate frequencies and how to manipulate matter. Mm -hmm. um, so they were so far in advance. Uh, and plus, this was like a wild, wild west for them. They had no real laws here yeah. keeping them in check. So when they sort of, at first, they would combat each other as to, is this ethical to do or just not ethical wow. to do? And then later on, you start to see it was just like, whatever goes, you know, it was like, just do whatever. Right, right, right. And it was they like, got used to the fact that there was no oversight. It, exactly, no oversight. When they got used to it, they just went crazy. I mean, they literally just, just went completely off the ranch. Yeah. And unfortunately for us, uh, it put us in the jackpot and there was nothing we can do because we didn't have the understanding or the technology to combat them. We had the numbers. So what they did was, since we used to live for a very long time before they even got here, mm -hmm. um, we at the Tower of Babel incident, we were actually building a tower. Now whether that was a cargo cult and we were mimicking something we saw them build, mm -hmm. or we literally had become technologically advanced enough to build something, it, it, it literally uh, threatened their power. And Enlil, who's known as Yahweh in the Bible, yeah. but your Bible just stole that story from the ancient Sumerian tablets, yeah. he's, he's, uh, he's Enlil, the brother of Enki. He sees this tower, he gets extremely disgusted, and he knocks this tower down. Uh, not only does he knock the tower down, this is when I knew as a kid when I read this that that, that wasn't talking about the God of the universe, because it didn't make sense that people were working together and then this God who created a universe would come back and destroy something that people worked together to build. Then he says something very interesting. He says, my seed shall not abide in man forever, his years shall be 120. Hmm. Well, scientists at Harvard just discovered under the most pristine conditions a human being should live to 120 years. Mm -hmm. Well, why is this? The telomere caps on chromosome number two, which they have now peer-reviewed science tells us that this cap was put there on this chromosome and it forces us to live that long. And only what happens is the genetic material inside these telomeres starts to disappear over time as your cells and DNA replicate. It's like a buffer material. They discovered a way to stop this buffer material from disappearing from these telomeres, and they've extended the life of mice two to three times. Wow. Which means they can do it in humans yeah. now. Which is now crucial for us, because if we don't take back control of this planet, they're going to start selling us time. Selling us time. What does that mean? Well, do you want to live to 150? I'll live to 500. It's going to cost you. <laughs> wow. It's going to cost you oh, a million wow. credits. You want yeah. to live to 150? It's going Makes to sense. Yeah. They got the technology. 
and this is a good way to put it out, the capitalism, exactly. one product line at a time, right? Exactly. Maybe in 100 years, it'll come out with a 300-year capsule. There you go. Right, right, right. So with it's, this brings us up to the question that you don't need a higher level of consciousness to have supreme advanced technology mm -hmm. because these individuals didn't seem that they had compassion service to others, right? right. Some of them maybe did, but mm -hmm. for the most part, obviously we are a product of what had happened with right. it. But they had high advanced technology. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between a conscious technology and what we're creating compared to what they did? Well, what I think is that in order to get to a level that they had achieved, you have to become extremely conscious. So all civilizations, according to the Yugas, have a rise and a fall. So at some point, their civilization had risen to a golden age. Mm. They got to a golden age, and then some of them broke away and had a breakaway civilization where they right. were strip mining probably asteroids and planets for resources for whatever reason they was doing it for. But we are, ourselves are looking to strip mine yeah. meteors right now, and we'd love to strip mine other planets as well, including our own moon for helium-3. So if we would do it, why wouldn't they do it? We're not even close to them. So they had the breakaway. Now, under, during the breakaway civilization stage, again, they have no oversight. So all these other thoughts start to come in and you start to get this God uh, type of a conscious. So you think you're a God for real and you're ruling over people and you're making decisions with no oversight and you're breaking every fundamental law that your civilization has already put in place and there's nobody to stop you. So now here comes the decline of that consciousness, but the technology already exists. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why you see them getting to this wow. state. That's very interesting because we've been going through the cycles of time here for quite some time. Um, 26,000 years cycles could have lasted millions of years. Yeah. Uh, we're only finding Atlantis now, which was probably one of the last great civilizations, yet it's still being considered myth and some people are trying to debunk it. So just imagine about all the civilizations that existed on this planet that completely wiped out. Yeah. So it's interesting that we were in a situation where we wiped ourselves out, so we lost a lot of this technology. Mm -hmm. So other civilizations could have left, maintained what they had so they didn't destroy themselves, yeah and then just use the technology for thousands of years. Exactly. Right, right. That's exactly what I feel happened. And that's how, because at first I was like, man, these Anunnaki are such warring, aggressive people. How yeah. can they even get to this level? But then I realized cycles of, of, uh, of, of civilizations. And I believe that that's a universal type of a law where civilizations rise and fall all over. And when I read the Emerald Tablets, both talks about going to other planets and watching men, civilizations rise and fall. And I said, that's it. That's the answer. Yeah. So how does this connect to monotheism? Because in um, Sumerian scripture, in Hindu Mahabharata, um, mm -hmm. even though I consider them still monotheistic because truly they go back to one source, one God, in even the Hindu scriptures, yeah. the Yahweh was part of this, came from the Sumerian scriptures, right? However, they chose one God and decided that there was only one God. How did that even happen in the first place? Well, you see, um, they had the Elohim, which is plural for gods. Yeah. And these uh, Elohim or these Anunnaki, whatever you want to call them, they all uh, were not even close to being the creator of the universe. But they themselves had somebody they called the creator of all. Yep. Uh, so they believed in the one God at some point. But these, they masqueraded as gods in Amun-Ra, who took over uh, kingship of ancient Kim or Egypt uh, in the age of Pisces. Uh, which is why a lot of Christians have that fish on the back of their car. They don't realize that it's really yep. from the Amun-Ra yep. kingship. Uh, but he um, he ordered that there only be one God and it be Him. Ah. He got tired of going back and forth and sharing the the honor, or you want to call it, with his with his cousins and his nephews and everybody else who were already ru ruling different areas around the planet. And he's the one who decreed that mm. at the end of every prayer, you give thanks to me, Amen Ra. So that's where the I, Amen comes from. When you say Amen, you're giving thanks to one of the most brutal rulers of all time. Wow. He took over power uh, via war early because the age of Pisces hadn't even arrived yet. So he kind of bullied his way in. They finally re uh, let him have it. And then um, uh, this guy just told evil. So he actually told Akhenaten, he's a sun disc for Akhenaten. Yeah that uh, I want to usher in this monotheistic type of a uh, society right. to go around and deface all the gods except, my, except me. So this is where Akhenaten began to uh, become infamous by going around defacing all of the other gods, erasing hieroglyphs, like literally chipping them out and erasing their actual history, which pissed everybody off, which is why they wanted to get rid of this guy. Uh, but it was, to, it was to usher in monotheism. A lot of people believe that, well, a lot of... Um, Unfortunately, a lot of African people, African-American people, believe that uh, these faces and these noses were all chipped off because Europeans didn't want everybody to know that some of these people were black, but that's not the case. When you really dig into the history, you discover that Amun-Ra is the one who ordered 
these faces to be chipped and defaced and noses broken and everything else. Yeah. In other words, to take away their 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 um, their power that they had over people by the way they physically looked in these glyphs. Right. Uh, that, in other words, if the god can be can be wiped away on on a on a slab of granite, yeah. you only have to look to one, the one that's left, and that was uh, the sun disk or the sun god Amun Ra. Wow. Was Akhenaten and Amun Ra having physical communication with each other, or was it some astral interdimensional? I think they were having physical communication. I think there were a lot of Anunnaki communicating directly with uh, pharaohs and people on this planet through the stellas. The stellas were known to give off sound and voices, I believe because they're made of crystal granite. Crystal is a receiver of, of uh, radio frequencies. Yeah. And it'd be very easy for me to transmit a frequency into a crystal receiver and have a voice come out of it. So it wasn't magic and it wasn't mystical. It was real technology being used to communicate back and forth with pharaohs and kings. Mm -hmm. What's your take on mainstream archaeology and what they're attempting to convey? I just listened to George Knapp um, show the other day, and George was saying um, he decided to have a mainstream archaeologist on there in order for him to convey what they believe because he wanted both sides. Mm -hmm. Everything that I heard was kind of nonsensical. It was choosing one, oh, this case on this giant does not exist because I've proven this wrong. Therefore, ad hominem, none of them exist, yeah. right? So what's, what's your take on them? What would you say to those archaeologists? The mainstream archaeologists are, unfortunately, I, they're puppets. They, they're trying to do one thing, and that's maintain their uh, way of living, maintain their income, maintain their grants, uh, their nonprofit status, and you know, so forth. So what they've got to do is they've got to go with the overlords, the, whatever the overlords tell them yeah. they're allowed to say. If they go against that, they can risk losing their house, their car payments, and everything else. They won't get any money. They don't have any money for their projects. Right, they won't right. be able to travel and do their stuff. So unfortunately, they've kind of sold themselves out in a way uh, because they haven't found a way to generate their own revenue so that they can do real research. Uh, so I, yeah. I, you know, they're, everything that they're talking about is really nonsensical. Yeah. Uh, they, they make up theories that become almost like doctrine yeah. and it spreads through the whole society and, uh, and people take it as, as fact when it's actually fiction. And then they cover up a lot of stuff for the powers that be. They, they sweep stuff under the rug. They hide information. They destroy evidence. Uh, so they're really doing this planet and the human beings on this planet a disservice. I liken them to, um, uh, you, know, un, you know, people that are underlings that are just working for some overlords personally. I hate to, to put them down like that, but that's what they're doing. When you do that, that yeah. kind of stuff, you're undermining the human race. And a lot of them are completely feel that they are in the tr uh, speaking truth. The best way to get people to tell you a lie is to have them convinced that they're telling you the truth, right? Yep. So it's, it's, it's really interesting because, like, there's not too many of us that believe this. There's a lot, and obviously we're connecting with them all the time, like Facebook everywhere. But there's not the consensus of the world really isn't into this information. Mm -hmm. So it's so interesting to observe that it is, they are literally delusional, right? Yeah. The information is out there. But the, the duality of it all is that the ones that know the truth are being considered delusional, yeah. right? right? What do you feel? That, do you feel that this is going to um, change the world very soon, that we have hope in having our history books rewritten? How are we going to get those in charge mm -hmm. to allow at least yeah. for this information to come out? Or are they going to just lose power and it's going to come out that way? Well, nothing lasts forever. So all kingdoms rise and fall. Right now, we're living directly in the new Rome, which is America, and this kingdom itself will fall at some point. Yeah. Uh, and all it takes is for a critical mass amount of conscious people on this planet to get to a point where 30, 40 million people can wake up one day and go, we're going to say no. No to everything. We're going to say no to paying our mortgage payment. We're going to say no to keeping our money in your banks. We're going to say no to buying gas. We're going to say no to everything. We're not going to show up for work. Yeah. And when 20 to 30 million, maybe 40 million people do that all in the same day, uh, the entire system will collapse and be reorganized. We have to get to that point. I think we're a little ways off from being at that point. It won't be a revolution of a war where people are fighting against military and so forth. It's going to be a revolution of consciousness mm -hmm. where people literally do one thing, just say no. And when people come together in the millions and say no all at the same exact time, this planet is going to change for the better, and then yeah. we'll begin to see a lot of um, uh, things move, positive changes. positive changes for the human race itself. Yeah, yeah. 
we have power in numbers and together we're going to make this change and one by one we're all waking up and right. a lot of people some i've seen go back to you know yeah. where they where they were before or some fundamentalists but a lot of people are waking up and not going back to it and we're teaching our kids so it's inevitable right yeah. the cycles of time are true you look at the science behind it all we can see that we're evolving we've had these cycles and that we are going up mm -hmm. on the precipice yes. how we get there all the chaos it's up to us right yeah. it's all our perspective right right Absolutely. so I love you, bro, bro, for everything that you do. You're an amazing person. I truly am inspired by the information you share. And um, I just want to say that just keep doing it, man. And we're going to be doing this together. It's going to be it's going to be a great journey together, bro. So thank you for everything you do, Billy. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. All right, everybody. This is Neil with the Portal to Ascension Conference here with Billy Carson, a.k.a. Forbidden Knowledge. Check him out on Instagram. Okay, love you all. Peace.